Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jogla 66, Hour of the Truth. We have today the 23rd of July 2016. <laughs> I was almost, I was almost saying 2017. No, no, it's still 2016. And I'm reading to you Chapter 5 of the book Behind the Dictators by Leo Herbert Lehmann called Hitler and the Catholic Church. Hitler is a product of the Catholic Church. He has never renounced the religious doctrines nor condemned the political aims and aspirations of the church into which he was born and baptized. Just as his father regarded the Catholic priesthood as the highest state to which anyone could aspire, so to him as child the priest appeared as the ideal human being. In his autobiography Hitler says, that he was deeply impressed with the religious ceremonies of the Catholic Church and was a member of the choir in his parish church. In his free time, he took singing lessons at the nearby monastery. This, he says, supplied me with the best opportunity to steep myself in the solemn magnificence of the brilliant feasts of the Church. These early emotions never completely disappeared and he has always remained conscious of the extremely suggestive value of ecclesiastical surroundings. Toward the end of his book he describes, quote, the psychological conditions which tend to create that artificial and mysterious half-light in Catholic churches, the wax, tapers, the incense, end quote. End quote. In fact, in his Mein Kampf, which you know was written by Jesuit father Stempfler, not Hitler himself. In his Mein Kampf, Hitler approves of everything particularly relating to Jesuit Catholicism as opposed to Protestantism. He approves of the indisputability of the Catholic dogmas, of the intolerant attitude of Catholic education, of the necessity of blind faith, of the personal infallibility of the Pope, imposed upon the Church by the Jesuits in 1870 in the First Vatican Council by Pio Nono, the, by my listeners and viewers, very well known Pope Pius IX. And I want to remember always when I use his name that you read the Syllabus of Errors from 1864 to know the Catholic, the Roman Catholic standpoint regarding people's governments and of the compulsory celibacy of the Catholic clergy. These are all matters that make Catholicism radically different from the other churches of Christendom. Well, of course, because Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. I will not expand further on this here because I did sufficient readings and other videos where that is proven beyond doubt for anybody with eyes to see and ears to hear. Roman Catholicism is not Christianity. In an open and prophetic expression of his admiration for the Catholic Church, he says, quote, Thus the Catholic Church is more secure than ever. It can be predicted that, as passing phenomena vanish away, she will remain as a beacon light amid these vanishing elements, attracting blind adherents in ever-increasing numbers." Unquote. This enthusiastic declaration of the Führer is not only an expression of the prophetic sense generally attributed to him, but the manifestation of a desire firmly rooted in his soul. Like all Catholics of Central Europe, he was educated to resist Protestantism. The historical enemy which has always endeavored to detach governments and peoples from the political and religious influence of the Church of Rome. Throughout his book he has no word of disapproval for the Jesuit campaign against all forms of Protestantism. It is true that in places he states that both Protestantism and Catholicism as religious units are of equal worth so far as his national socialism is concerned. But an analysis of his, of his particular statements regarding the two religious systems immediately shows how closely he is bound to ultramontane Catholicism. And who does not know what ultramontane Catholicism is? I will 
give you a link in the description box of the video that you can read that for yourself. But in short, it means that all power is vested in one person, the Pope, the Antichrist, the Vicar of Christ, as he calls himself. In the matter of racism and anti-Semitism, Hitler clearly indicates his hostility to Protestantism. He says, quote, Protestantism opposes in an extremely vigorous manner every attempt that is made to rid the nation of its worst enemy. In fact, the position of Protestantism with regard to Judaism is more or less dogmatically fixed. But we have now come to a point where this problem will have to be solved. Otherwise, all attempts at the renaissance, renaissance of Germany and national regeneration will be of no avail. Unquote. Now, remember please that Antichrist Pope Leo XIII stated to the German Kaiser that Germany shall become the sword of the Roman Catholic Church. How true his words were considering the Vatican Red Lines and Operation Paperclip after World War II to continue the Nazi policy in the United States of America. A country whose governmental foundation was laid by Jesuits hiding under so-called Protestantism. Anybody who sees resemblance to the 4th century when pagan Rome did the same with biblical Christianity? Eh? Infiltration is the politics of the Roman Catholic Church and her military arm, the Society of Jesus. Rome just never changes. The author continues, it is true that Protestantism can never associate itself with Jesuit racism. The protest to Hitler by the German confessional church in 1936 makes this clear. Quote, Antisemitism, it says, often provokes excesses that nothing can justify and which are merely the result of hatred for the Jewish minority. Unquote. The identity of Hitler's ideology with that of traditional Jesuit Catholicism cannot be denied. You got that? The identity of Hitler's ideology with that of traditional Jesuit Catholicism cannot be denied, nor the fact that by ruthless persecution and armed might and collaboration with the other Catholic dictators, he has forwarded the ultimate objectives of the Roman Catholic Church. Hitler, Mussolini, Franco and Salazar, the Catholic dictator of Portugal that is, ousted Jewish, Masonic and Protestant influence from all of Europe, from the Arctic to the Mediterranean. In spite of this, however, many in America are still skeptical of any predetermined connection between Nazi fascism and Jesuit Catholicism. Yeah, because the people do not know the true history. Their unknowing is not to blame, but their ignorance of facts when presented to them. And that is for all the peoples in the world the same, not only for Americans, I can assure you that. They point, now this goes further, of course, about the people in America, they point to the persecution of the Catholic Church in Germany and to professions of faith and democracy by some Catholic spokesmen in the United States. There is here a case of obvious contradiction between reality and appearance. There is here a case of obvious contradiction between reality and appearance. In the first place, Nazi opposition to the Catholic Church in Germany has been confined to its liberal elements, and Catholic leadership has always opposed these more than any others. Well, why? Because the liberals in the Church of Rome are the weakest link in their chain of command. The Jesuit party has long feared the infiltration of Protestant and liberal ideas into the German Catholic mind. During the post-war years, post-war World War I we speak about here, when Germany was a democratic republic, ha ha, that was a joke, many of the ordinary secular clergy and some of the religious orders became 
enamoured of the liberal secularizing spirit. They formed the backbone of the Catholic Center Party, which was the last bulwark against Hitler's rise to power. But this last element of liberalism in Germany was dissolved by order of Pope Pius XI, as a stipulated condition of the Vatican's concordat with Nazism. Its leader, Klausner, was assassinated in the blood purge of June 30th, 1934. You know, the night of the long knives where they killed off the SA. The last liberal party in Italy also, headed by the exiled priest Don Sturzo, shared, shared the same fate at the hands of the same antichrist Pope Pius XI. It is nothing new in Catholic history that religious and social reformers from within the Church should be the first to suffer its enmity. The heretics of history delivered over to autocrat civil power for burning and imprisonment by the Church are mute witnesses to this unchanging policy of intransigent Catholicism. It can easily be seen that the identity of Jesuit political thought with the objectives of Nazi fascism makes it imperative to conceal it from the American public. Were it otherwise, the Catholic Church would suffer complete loss of its prestige in the United States, in the eyes of Catholics and in the eyes of non-Catholics alike. It is not surprising, therefore, that the following evident contradictions may be noted with regard to Catholic Church propaganda. First, opposing views of Jesuit authors and actual questions concerning politics, economics and even religious matters. Second, the adoption of national peculiarities in all countries, even in pagan lands. Third, the combating of socialism with one hand and uttering it friendship with the other. Remember the Cold War? Fourth, the favoring of chauvinist and nationalist views as well as of international Pacific tendencies. Five, the making of eloquent declarations in favor of democracy and at the same time seizing upon every possible means to undermine and wreck it. 6. The creation of situations apparently contradictory of one another. Well, all of these six points that I've just read are clearly the goals of a soldier in the army of Loyola, according to their oath. Apart from this, there is nothing insincere on the part of intransigent Catholic leadership. The guiding forces of modern Catholicism are as sincere in their conviction as their predecessors of old that nothing good can come out of liberal political and social regimes. Liberalism in religion is anathema to them, and their greatest enemy. They desire peace, but hold with the Nazi fascists that peace can come only by war, with all its appalling consequences, as a necessary evil. For by victorious war alone, they hold, can men and nations to be made to submit to the hierarchical idea of a world order of states, races and individuals. I think Mr. Lehman almost used the word a new world order. <laughs> but of course there you don't have states anymore. Their conviction is that peace can come only from that harmonious acquiescence of men bound to their natural place in society and religion. From its apex, this pyramid of states is to be totally ruled by the theocratic institution of the Roman Catholic Church, with the Pope of Rome as the Vicar of Jesus Christ and the sole mouthpiece of Almighty God. Alone and without well-planned direction, Adolf Hitler never could have accomplished what he did to this end. All the world is now convinced that he was no idle dreamer, nor just a poor paper hanger when he attempted his Munich Beer Hall Putsch. His visions were realistically sketched out for him by those who directed him as a youth, at the grandeur of their ideas of a totalitarian world 
symbolized in ritualistic ceremonies and in cathedrals and churches, urged him to action. When Hitler drew Austria into his hierarchic confederation, his action was greeted by hails from the Catholic Church prelates. After his bloody absorption of Czechoslovakia and the land of the hated Hussites, there was rejoicing again within the Catholic world. A feeble, easily answered complaint from the Vatican followed his blitzkrieg that brought Catholic Poland again into the orbit of a centrally controlled Europe. Definite refusal met the request of President Roosevelt, through his peace ambassador to the Vatican, that Pope Pius XII condemn Hitler's invasion of Protestant Denmark and Norway. Only short-sighted idealistic Americans failed to understand that Hitler and the intransigent leaders of the Roman Catholicism are one with Mussolini when he declared, quote, Capitalism, parliamentarism, democracy, socialism, communism, and a certain facilitate, uh, vacillating Catholicism, with which sooner or later we shall deal in our style, are against us. Again, that you understand this very well, this quote from fascist Italian dictator Mussolini. Capitalism, parliamentarism, democracy, socialism, communism, and a certain vacillating Catholicism, with which sooner or later we shall deal in our style, are against us. Unquote. All of these, particularly the last, are the forces which the Jesuits and their counter-reformation have fought against and made use of since the time of Martin Luther and his associates. So, this chapter 5 was quite a short one from Leo Herbert Lehman, but as I already said in the beginning, this book is short and there are things where you can come in for an hour and there are things where you don't have to come in very much because the book is very precise and this was a very precise chapter of the book. You have to understand that Leo Herbert Lehman wrote this in 1942, but I think that everybody who listens to this now in 2016 or even later will see the resemblance between the time plus 70 years ago now and the time we have today. And I don't have to go into all the exposure of Roman Catholicist faults, mistakes and errors in this reading, because I've done that on numerous other occasions. So I think even that this little chapter from Behind the Dictators, Hitler and the Catholic Church, chapter 5, was quite sure, though it is very interesting to understand and hear it from the feather of Leo Herbert Lehman, who wrote this in 1942, and to understand where we are today. And we have to consider that Rome never changes. They plan hundreds of years in advance their steps because they know and they understand the word of God. That's very important, people. Because Satan does know the Bible that well, he can act that way. Even though he does not see that in the end the Lamb will overwin and not he. Our Lord and Jesus Christ will come back like the stone that was not hewn with hands out of the mountain that will trash the figure of Daniel's second uh, chapter, the statue of the head of gold, the shoulders and arms of bronze, the thighs of um, silver, uh, sorry, <laughs> the arms and the shoulders of silver and the thighs of bronze and the iron legs and the Ten toes of iron mixed with miry clay in the foot and destroy all earthly man-made kingdoms. And our Lord will set up his own everlasting kingdom. Can't wait for that moment. So, 
Never neglect your Bible studies next to reading and listening to books like this. But here again we've had confirmation that Adolf Hitler was from the moment he was born until the moment he died, whether that was in 1945 or later somewhere in South America, doesn't matter, he was a Catholic, poor song. So uh, uh, that's the way that they say it in, in French. Down to the core, he was a Catholic. And with that, all his politics, everything that Hitler ever did, was in the light of Catholic doctrine. He was listening to his superiors, which came out of the Jesuit order. Whether it was Franz von Papen, Knight of Malta, Jesuit controlled, or it was Kurt Heinrich Himmler, that we've learned earlier about, the master Jesuit father behind Heinrich Himmler, who was, according to Adolf Hitler, his Ignatius of Loyola. Anyway, this was chapter 5 of Behind the Dictators and I'm looking forward to do the next reading and uh, do the next video for you in chapter 6, which is called The Catholic Church and the Cooperative State. Until then, God bless you, take care, and Chapter 66, Hour of the Truth, signing off. Bye-bye.